Right on. Okay, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. And you can turn there in your Bibles. But just before you do, go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And I'll invite you guys to stand stand with me. And I want to read uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, as we get into the Word of God this morning. It says this, Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Lord, I thank you that we can just uh, come and spend this time together. In your word this morning, we thank you for adoption. We thank you that you're our father. We thank you that that is possible through Christ Jesus, that we can be adopted into the family of God. And we thank you, Lord, this morning for your kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that it would advance in our hearts and in our lives, in our church, in this community, Lord, in our nation, in the world. And, uh, Lord, we want to lay hold of your kingdom. We want to be part of your kingdom. We desire, Jesus, that you would exert your rule over our lives. And so, Father, would you speak to us through the word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right on. Okay, Mark chapter 2, you may be seated. Uh, picking up where we've left off as we've been making our way through uh, Mark's gospel, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And uh, we're partway through this chapter, chapter 2. And um, I just want to remind you or bring you up to speed if you haven't been with us on uh, the last few Sundays, or in particular last week, uh, where we've been in Mark's gospel. Mark's, Mark's gospel, chapter 2 and into verse 3, is organized... Um, Five short narratives uh, that demonstrate the rising opposition that was uh, coming against Jesus as his ministry began to grow and expand. And in his ministry, Jesus demonstrated an authority that was um, shocking in its scope, shocking in its power. He announced the good news. He announced the coming of the kingdom of God, the fullness of time. And he said that the proper response to the rule and dominion of God and his kingdom was this, that you repent and believe the good news. And the announcement of his kingdom was not limited to a, a verbal pronouncement, a verbal proclamation or a declaration. Jesus announced the kingdom and then he gave evidence or demonstrated the power of the kingdom by the things that he was doing. And the message was exciting. The authority and, and the miracles and the things that Jesus was teaching, the power present in him was unprecedented. It, unprecedented. it was like nothing that had ever been seen before. Men followed him at a command. Follow me. And they dropped everything and followed him. He cast out and silenced unclean spirits. He healed many like a leper. In, in ways that people had never seen before. And he even claimed the authority to be able to forgive sins. And so he exhibited power over the material physical realm. And then he claimed to have authority over the spiritual realm. And he said this, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And in doing so... He was upsetting the apple cart of the religious institution and the leaders of Israel. And they were yet unsure about Jesus and unsure about his identity in their minds and in their beliefs. His actions and his deeds were treading into the realm of blasphemy. His followers and those with whom he was spending a lot of time were not the respectable people of Israel, so to speak. And so it didn't take long for opposition against Jesus to just begin to grow. And, and it was like a, you know, a war beginning to assemble against this teacher from Galilee. And so Mark organizes his gospel in this way that he gives five narratives starting in chapter 2 verse 1 that reveal 
more about Jesus and his authority while also documenting the hostility and the opposition that he was facing. And so we did this. Last week we looked at the first two of these five narratives. This morning we're going to look at the last of the last three. And each of these narratives, they're, they're totally great, amazing, awesome Bible stories in and of themselves. But they're organized by Mark in a particular way to show this rising opposition. And so for the sake of just kind of jogging your memory, if you were here with us last week or getting you ca caught up to speed, if you weren't, let me remind you of this little outline that we followed. And maybe you could look at your Bibles at chapter 2. And I'll just point out the five narratives. The first is Jesus healing the paralytic. Mark chapter 2 Verse 1 to 12, it's an account of unspoken opposition in the hearts of men. Jesus did a, uh, a, an amazing thing. He claimed to forgive this man's sin. And those who were there present with Jesus at that time and those uh, in the room, in their hearts, the leaders began to question. They say, hey, who does this man think he is that he has the authority to forgive sin? And the scripture tells us Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. And, and so he, the first opposition that we see here is just in the hearts of men. Secondly, is in the calling of the account of Jesus calling Levi. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. It ends up that, that Jesus uh, arrives at the house of Levi after he's called him. And Levi throws this great uh, party, a great feast for tax collectors and sinners, and they're there with Jesus. And the religious leaders looked upon the disciples of Jesus, and they first asked this question, not about Jesus. It was an indirect opposition. They asked about his disciples. They said, what is it with this man? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? So we looked at those two narratives last week, and this morning uh, we're going to look at these three, a question about uh, fasting in Mark chapter 2, verse 18 to 22, it's a spoken opposition. It's not about Jesus himself, but it's again about his disciples. It's a comparative opposition. Comparing his disciples to the disciples of John and the followers of the Pharisees. And it's about fasting. Hey, why, why don't your disciples fast? They're going to be asked. The fourth narrative is about something that happened on a Sabbath. It's a spoken opposition. It's a complaint again about Jesus uh, his disciples, hey, why are they doing something, the complaint is, that's unlawful on the Sabbath as they walk through the field and pluck heads of grain and eat them. And then the fifth account of opposition, it's kind of the, the climax. It's the everything, you know, ripening as it goes just from being in the hearts of men to being this plot against Jesus. He heals a man who has a withered hand on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And Jesus, again, confronts what's in the hearts of men. They don't say anything, but there's something happening in their hearts. And he addresses what's happening in their hearts with a question. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? And so these five, these five narratives, well, this one concludes with them going out and plotting to destroy Jesus. How are they going to get rid of him? How are they going to murder him? And so we'll, we'll look at these last three this morning. So Mark wants us to see this progression of opposition against Jesus, beginning with a question in the heart until it ripens to a plot to destroy him. And so uh, let's jump in here to the third narrative. Verse 18 it says this, chapter 2. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisee fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse terror is made. And no one puts new wine, skin, new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. So the complaint is this. The complaint is this. John's disciples fast. 
The followers and the Pharisees themselves were fasting. And really, when you, when you read this, this is a strange partnership. The disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees. Now, John the Baptist was anything but friendly with the Pharisees. I mean, the gospel accounts tell us that, that the religious leaders of Israel were often targets in his preaching, in his crosshairs, as he called out their hypocrisy and called them to repentance. On their part, the Pharisees rejected the ministry of John the Baptist. They didn't even acknowledge that he was sent from God. And as often is the case, when there's opposition against Jesus, there can be a, a, a strange group of bedfellows that will come together uh, to be against Jesus. And so here it is, John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees. Now, John's disciples fasted. That's what we read here. Fasting for them was an expression of their repentance, their, their heart's desire to be right with God. They fasted because they wanted to give a demonstration of the of the seriousness with which they desired to be right with the Lord. They were willing to deny the appetites of the flesh, their physical hunger to pursue the things of God. The Pharisees also fasted. In fact, historically, Pharisees fasted twice a week. They fasted every Tuesday and every Thursday, every week, twice a week. And they considered fasting just part of their religion. And, and as we know, the Gospels tell us this, they weren't, they weren't shy about advertising when they were fasting. I mean, they made sure to look like, hey, man, you know, I'm going without food to seek the Lord. You know, instead of it being a private thing, as fasting is supposed to be, between yourself and the Lord, they let everyone know that with a demonstration of, you know, their devotion to how religious they were, that they were foregoing food. Hey, how's your going? they going, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm so hungry because I'm fasting. But, you know, don't mind me. I'm so spiritual. Okay, that was them. And so all Pharisees fasted twice a week. And so together, the disciples of John and the Pharisees noticed that Jesus and his disciples were enjoying a lot of dinner parties. You know, like that one that took place at Levi's house when Jesus was there hanging out with tax collectors and sinners and there was a lot of laughter, you know. There was a lot of fun wherever Jesus was around. And so some of the people came to Jesus and they asked this question, why do other groups fast and your disciples don't? And so look again with me at verse 19. It says this, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast in that day. So Jesus says this. He says, you know, fasting during a wedding party, wasn't, that doesn't make much sense. You know, a wedding's not a time of fasting. A wedding's a time of, of feasting. Fasting is a time of abstaining from food, but a wedding is a joyful celebration that always involves feasting. He was thinking about this. Among all the, the planning that goes on around a wedding, there's a huge amount of effort and energy and money and time and finances spent around the meal, isn't there? It's like, oh, wow, we're going to a wedding. I wonder what they're serving. Yeah, like, it's like, that's part of the joy of going to a wedding. And I would say this, around a wedding, like, it's like, probably the most significant cost and time and energy is spent around the, the meal. And I have the blessing, you know, as a pastor, going to a number of weddings every year because I officiate them. And I've never gone to a wedding where they said this, hey, we're going to have a fast at our wedding. Because if they ever did that, I would say, find another pastor to officiate it, okay? A wedding is a time of feasting, not a time to fast. There's plenty of times to fast, plenty of other times. A wedding is not that time. A wedding's a holy celebration. A wedding is a sacred event between a man and a woman and God where a marriage covenant is formed and it is a time of joy, a time to rejoice. You know, you'd actually think this. If someone's miserable on their wedding day, it's probably like you should probably pack your bags and run before this whole thing goes down. It's not a time to be miserable. It's not a time to lament. Wedding's a time of joy. On the wedding day, a new covenant is formed and this kind of holiness has 
the holiness of a marriage covenant has much joy and celebration. It's, it's not solemn. It's not with a sense of heaviness that a marriage happens. It's, it's solemn, but it's infused with joy. Solomon actually wisely said this, that there's a time and a place for everything. And so two things to me are significant as we read this account. Firstly, I think this, the disciples in, uh, uh, of John and the Pharisees were not recognizing the time that was upon them. They didn't recognize the time that was upon them. You know, it's always wise to ask the Lord to help us. Father, would you help me know the day, the time in which we live? To recognize the season around us. So firstly, they didn't recognize the time in which they lived. And secondly, and more importantly, is the claim of Jesus to be the bridegroom. In many places, in the Old Testament, the people of God are pictured and they are spoken of as a bride. And Jesus didn't pick this analogy up out of thin air. What he was saying was absolutely thick with meaning. It's a pregnant analogy because as the Old Testament pictures the people of God as a bride and the Lord himself pictures, uh, displays himself as the bridegroom, Jesus is portraying himself in a biblical, historical analogy in a place that belongs to God. The bridegroom's here. Let me give you an example. It's one of just many. But how about from Isaiah? Chapter 54, verse 5 through 8. It says this. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God, who, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife. Deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast, cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love. I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is a very pregnant picture from the Old Testament that Jesus lays hold of. When he calls himself the bridegroom. As we see right here in Isaiah. The Lord refers to himself as the husband of his people. He refers to his people as his wife. And to me this is another one of those places. That I would just say this. You know whenever you hear someone claim. You know Jesus never said that he was God. I'm like you don't know what you're talking about. You, you don't understand the scripture. You don't understand that every time Jesus opened his mouth. He was laying holds of hold of, of pictures and symbolism that was understood by the culture. Jesus claimed to be God in everything he was doing. And this claim to be the bridegroom should have called to mind that ancient hope of the children of Israel commonly expressed in all the prophets. The bridegroom had come. They were not understanding the time of his appearing. This was not a time for lamenting. It was not a time for fasting. It was a time for joy, for feasting, not for fasting. Like a wedding. Whenever a wedding is being planned and prepared, there are so many things to be considered, and the feast is just part of it. Of course, there's the wine, too. You know, what kind of wine should we drink, you know, at the wedding? I have to say this, I think that it's good to abstain. You know, if the Lord's called you to abstain from alcohol in this life, that's very good. But I'll tell you this, in the kingdom to come, you will not be an abstainer. There's going to be a wedding feast. And you're going to break that rule that you're clinging to. You're going to drink of the wine. Wine matters at a wedding. And then there's this suggestion like, hey, well, what should we wear? You know, we're going to the wedding. Everyone puts thought into what you should wear at a wedding. Every bride, every groom, every guest, every person that participates in a wedding thinks about what they're going to wear when there's a wedding. No one goes to a wedding without considering, is what I, am, am, am what I'm wearing, is it appropriate for the celebration that I'm going to? You know, we're not attending a fast. We're going to a wedding. 
and there's going to be a feast and wine is going to be served. What should I wear? And so addressing the question of the day, Jesus talks about appropriate attire for a wedding. Look again at verse 21. He says this. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. So the second analogy here, it's not, it's not disconnected from the first. I think too often we do this. Don't disconnect it from the first, which is about a bridegroom and a wedding. And you have to consider what you're going to wear if you're going to attend a wedding. So here's something I will guarantee no one does when it comes to a, to a participation in a wedding celebration. They don't pull out the oldest, most worn out garment out of their closet, do they? The one so worn out, the one that you just, you know, guys, we all have that t-shirt. The only one that you wear around your house, it's got holes and all the stitching all the way down. The sh- my wife, my, my favorite t-shirt has just disappeared. And Lisa, I don't know if you're guilty I don't know if you're guilty, but it's gone. I can't find it. It may have disintegrated last time it was in the dryer. I don't know. No one pulls out an old worn out garment, sews a piece of unshrunk cloth onto it, and and then wears it to a wedding. And so men, listen to me for a second. Let me give you some advice, okay? Guys, I have some instruction for you. You know that old suit you've got? You know the one. It was cool in the 90s, maybe the 80s. That tie is like wide enough that I don't know what you could do with it. Look at if you wore that suit in the 90s and it looked good, I just want to remind you it's 2024. We're in a new millennium. The only person falling for that suit is you, okay? If there is ever a time that deserves or is worthy of a new suit or for a woman, a new outfit. It's a wedding, isn't it? It's a wedding. So guys, let me give you another piece of advice. Pick on the men this morning. If you're going to a wedding and your wife decides that she needs a new outfit, shut your mouth and hand her the bank card, okay? (laughs) Shut your mouth, give her the credit card, okay? Ladies, if you are attending a wedding, you have full permission from me as the pastor of this church To say to your husband, my pastor said I could buy a new dress for that wedding, okay? And guys, don't be cheap, okay? A wedding is not a time to be a miser. That's what Jesus is saying. No one one pulls out an old rag, sews a new chunk of unshrunk cloth onto it. You never do that, let alone for attending a wedding. Now, here's the point. Jesus had not showed up to patch up the old system. That's what he's saying. I'm, I'm not here to stitch something new onto you Pharisees and what you're doing. I haven't appeared to, to sew and to mend up the ministry of John the Baptist. This is not a sewing job. This is not fancy patchwork. Let me fix some problems with Judaism here. No, no, no. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is not a renovation of the old Pharisees and John the Baptist. This is something entirely new that I'm calling people to participate in. The bridegroom has appeared. This is a feast, not a fast. This is a time to replace that old suit. This is a time that deserves a new dress. A time to consider what wine should we serve at this amazing event. And look at verse 22. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skin and the wine will be destroyed and so are the skins. But but new wine is for fresh wineskins. New wine for fresh wineskins. He's talking about new wine and old wineskins. And Jesus says, you know, that's a bad combination. New wine and old wineskins. Old wineskins, they lose their flexibility. They get stiff and crusty. And if you put new wine into them, the fermentation of the wine and the process that it goes through, it's going to burst that wineskin. 
The wine's going to be ruined. The skin's going to be ruined. It's all wrecked. The wine in Scripture, you know who that is, right? That's a picture of who? The Holy Spirit. The wine is the Holy Spirit, and the wineskin represents the believer. And Jesus, as he speaks of this, Christ came to make us vessels. He came to make us vessels fit for the indwelling presence of his spirit. That's why the scripture says this, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. Let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit cannot be poured into your old life. You know, if you've yet to become a Christian and you're wondering, you're considering, you're weighing your options and you're thinking about what does it mean to follow Christ and what does all this entail? Let me tell you a very important truth about following Jesus Christ. And the truth is this, the Holy Spirit cannot be poured into your old life. That would be explosive. Everything would be ruined. It would be a disaster. So your life has to be prepared for the Holy Spirit, for his indwelling, for his baptism. When the Holy Spirit comes into you and when he comes upon you, the descriptions of what the Bible speaks of is very powerful. Jesus spoke of it as a, of the Spirit's work as a, a spring bursting forth streams of living water that flows from your belly. A river, a spring that will never run dry. At Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out like wine, there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind and there were tongues of fire. Filling, anointing, power, declarations of praise and proclamation of the gospel. These are forces that will tear your life apart unless Jesus makes you ready for the presence of his spirit. It, it, the Holy Spirit will tear your life apart unless you are fit for his presence and for his power. And for that to happen, you have to be made new. You have to be a new wineskin. So when we speak of our lives, the old will not do. The old cannot handle what the Holy Spirit is going to do. You must be a new wineskin. You must be made new. And Jesus wants to do this. He wants to wash away the old and make you new so that you're fit for the powerful presence of his spirit. Aren't you thankful for that? See, church, the kingdom of God's not a fast. Put on the new self. <laughs> Created to be like Christ Jesus. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. As Paul said, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Then we come to the fourth conflict, the fourth narrative of the opposition rising against Jesus. It starts in verse 23. It says this, One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. As they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the presence of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So the fourth narrative, the fourth conflict here, involves the Pharisees again. The Pharisees... We're guardians of the law. That's kind of, you know, I think guardians of the galaxy, guardians of the law. They understood the past of Israel as a nation, and they had a longing to participate in what God was going to do 
in the future, they understood, the Pharisees understood that, that in the past, Israel was exiled by foreign powers for the simple reason that as the people of God, they had not been faithful to Yahweh. They had been an unfaithful wife. In fact, the, the Old Testament picks up this, this picture, this analogy of, of spiritual adultery happening. They turned away from the Lord and his word. They, they didn't keep his law. They were careless about observance of the Sabbath. As the chosen people, in his word, the Lord gave Israel three things that made them unique amongst the nations of the world. Firstly was the rite of circumcision, right? Identifying them as covenant people. Then you had the dietary laws that they followed. Clean and unclean eating, kosher laws. And then thirdly, there was the Sabbath, Totally unique compared to other nations of the world. They were to have a relationship of trust with Yahweh. Other nations, their work was never done. But God's people, Israel, they trusted Yahweh as their provider. He is our rest, they said. Therefore, we can cease from our striving one day a week as an outward expression of an inward truth that we're experiencing. But Israel failed in that, particularly with the Sabbath, observing it. And it resulted in this. They were, they were taken into exile. They were overpowered by foreign nations, and they were taken as captives into foreign land. When God had mercy upon them, he restored the people back to the land and the Pharisees and their religious movement began to form during that time. It had good intentions. It had good, you know, roots to it all. And the Pharisees didn't want Israel to make the mistakes that they made in the past. They didn't want to be exiled from the land and repeat history. So the movement of the Pharisees was born and they, they functioned to uphold the ideal for God's people. To help the people of Israel hold to the realities that made them unique as the children of God. It was a good start. Sabbath rule and dietary laws, these are important things. And they believe this, the Pharisees. That if Israel would perfectly keep the law, if just as a people, as a nation, if we would perfectly keep the law, the Messiah will come and we'll never be exiled ever again. But if we fail, well, we face the potential of exile again. And so there was this belief if Israel could perfectly keep the law, the Messiah would come. So the Pharisees, they became the guardians of the law, dietary law. Sabbath. And in that role, they began to add to the law of God. We might even say that their, their traditions were well intended. I really believe that. That they were there to keep Israel pure so that the Messiah would come. But as is always the case with humans, traditions, additions to God's law, they, they turn into legalistic laws and rules, don't they? Rather than being free people to serve God, they began to serve rules made by men. The Sabbath that was intended to be a blessing became a burden. It placed a heavy weight upon the people of God. It became a day not of rest, but one governed by rules and do's and don'ts. No, we don't do that. No, we don't do that. Well, you can do that, but you can only go this far. You can only, you know, rules, rules, rules. And the Sabbath was robbed of its beauty. Robbed of its purpose. And the people of God were robbed of the blessing of the Sabbath. And so here's the disciples. Walking through a field. And there were rules about how far you could walk. <laughs> and they were hungry. And there was, was the Sabbath. But there was rules about you know, preparation of food on the Sabbath. And as they walked along. They, be, they plucked the grain. And they took the heads of grain. And they rubbed them in their hands and they separated the chaff from the kernel and they chewed on that. But it was the Sabbath. There were rules about harvesting. There were rules about threshing wheat. And there were rules about working. Rules, 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 rules. And they're all being broken. Uh, the Messiah was never going to come. I mean, take this from the perspective of the Pharisees. The Messiah was never going to come 
if men like the disciples of Jesus are going to treat the Sabbath like this. Like, don't miss the irony, right? Because there's the Messiah right there in front of them. This was not trivial to the Pharisees. And they were blinded to see the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, right in front of them. I mean, let me just comment to this and remind you. God's coming is not dependent on you keeping rules. Aren't you thankful for that? You keeping rules is not the basis of the Lord's desire to move in your life. He desires to work in you and to work in your life on the basis of himself, not on the basis of you. He simply says this, his word tells us this. If you will seek me, I will be found by you. Like it's that simple. If you seek me, I will be found by you. God's work in your life is on the basis of his own goodness and his own grace and not your rule keeping. So just be free, man. Seek your king and savior. The Pharisees questioned. Why are your disciples doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So let's make sure we get this right. Because the only laws that the disciples were breaking were the traditions of men. That's the only law they were breaking as they walked through the field and they plucked the kernels of, uh, of wheat and they, they chewed on them. They were not in contravention or violating the laws of God. They were violating the laws of men who were trying to safeguard the laws of God. Jesus gets a little cheeky. <laughs> I like this about Jesus. Haven't you guys read... Like the Pharisees didn't read the Bible, you know. It's like, have you ever heard this? I don't know if you're familiar with this story, guys, but there's this story in 1 Samuel chapter 1, maybe you've heard, or chapter 21, maybe you've heard of it. Haven't you read? And of course the Pharisees have read this. They know the Old Testament inside and out. They either make you and I look like an, embar an embarrassment. And Jesus points them to this account in 1 Samuel chapter 21 of David and the, high, uh, the priest Abathar. It's kind of a confusing story when you read it. You're like, well, what is David doing here? Like, is he supposed to do this? He went to the tabernacle. He's actually on the run from Saul. David had already been anointed to be the king of Israel. He was God's chosen anointed. And he was fleeing from a man who was pursuing his life. And David went to the priest because he had fled he'd gone in flight not taken anything with him in fact not even a sword because in this account he picks up the sword of Goliath from the high priest of Bathar and David says to Abathar is there anything to eat here Bathar says to him well there's the holy the bread of presence the bread of presence was presented to the Lord in the tabernacle there were 12 loaves it'd stay there for a week and each week it would be replaced. And the law said that only the priests were eligible to eat of this bread. Abathar said, well, there's the bread of the presence. I mean, I guess I could give that to you and your men if the men have kept themselves from women. There's a holy mission you're on. David's like, as in everything I do, it's to serve the king. It's a holy mission. And so Abathar Gave him the bread of the presence. I love this because the word of God is like this, right? It's like common sense trumps religious rules. It's like, is there someone in need? Then help him. Help them. And so who's David but in 1 Samuel chapter 21, the future king of Israel? And we know this, that the Lord made a covenant with David. It's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7. The Lord promised David as a man after his own heart and because of the way that he was seeking the Lord and some things that he was intending to do. The Lord said to him, I'm going to ensure that one of your descendants will reign on the throne of Israel forever and forever and forever. The Messiah. He'd be called the son of David. Now Mark's gospel. I think there's two important points to this little story. The first has to do with the identity of Jesus. This is important because this is what he's saying. 
the one greater than David is here. We miss this when we read this. We just think that he's making some reference to some Old Testament story. Listen, Jesus is the son of who? David. He is the son of David. Jesus here is placing himself on the same plane with even greater authority than that which belonged to David. And David was the man of Israel, the greatest king in their history, the hero of heroes, the man who slayed the giant, the man after God's own heart, the golden boy, the man from whom the son of David would come through his lineage. This isn't, this isn't a claim from Jesus to follow in the pattern of what David did and retell an interesting Old Testament story. For those with ears to hear, this is the claim, one greater than David is here. He's treading on very holy territory. I think, well, doesn't Jesus know? The son of David can't come until the people perfectly keep the rules. Like, that's what the Pharisees believe. That was the purpose of the Pharisees. That's the irony. You know, keep the rules and then he'll come. And they didn't recognize the time of his appearing. They didn't know that they were talking to the son of David. And the second important point has to do with the Sabbath itself. Look again at verse 27. It says this, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is Jesus claiming authority over the Sabbath. The most holy institution in Israel. He says this, The Sabbath was made for man. I'm man for the Sabbath, but the Pharisees are like, well, what about the rules, man? The rules. The rules, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, don't turn into a burden that which the Lord has made a blessing. Your rules are stupid. <laughs> the Father wants you to rest. The Father wants you to trust. And I'm thankful that as followers of Jesus Christ, the New Testament teaches us that Christ is our Sabbath. Our rest is not found in a day. It's wonderful it is to take a day off. Your rest is not found in a holiday, as important as that is. Your rest is found in a person, the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus, he is Lord of the Sabbath. And when he makes that claim, he's saying this. It means I can do what I like, man, on the Sabbath. The law is being replaced by the Lord. So church, we can't add to the work of Christ, but what we can do is we can rest in it. We can learn to rest. So then we come to the narrative that's the final conflict. Not coincidentally, it also happens on a Sabbath. Look at chapter 3. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Verse 6. The Pharisees went out immediately, held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. If you've been with us here in previous weeks, you know how significant Mark's usage of this word immediately is, because he hasn't touched on it for a little while in these narratives. They're in the synagogue. It's the Sabbath. There's a man there with a withered hand. He happens to be there. I mean, he's not asking to be healed. <laughs> he's not somebody who can't work. He's not somebody whose life is totally ruined by this disability that he has. He can walk. He's got one good arm. He's there with the people of God. He doesn't appear to be a plant. He's just there. And the Pharisees are also there, and they're watching with a purpose. They want to see what Jesus is going to do. 
And they want to come up with an accusation against him. And so Jesus does this. He, he knows what's going on. He calls the man with the withered hand, come stand here. Come here. This man stands up in front of everyone. Uh, what an awkward spot to be in that position. And Jesus asked this question to everyone. He said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? Mark says they were silent. It's like you read that. It's like, we all know the answer. We all know the answer, right? Do good. Save a life. It's like, someone's drowning? Go in after them. Someone's in need? Help them. This is not a trick question. Help the person in need. It, it doesn't matter what day of the week it is. Help. But they were silent. And their intentions were to trap Jesus. They didn't, and this is where it's really obvious. It's like, they don't care about people, do they? There's no compassion in the hearts of these men. And it made Jesus angry. It's an interesting fact about Jesus. It's like, you know, lovey-dovey Jesus and everything that people say about him sometimes. Look at this, he's angry. He's angry, but the original language expresses this idea that it was an anger that passed, that came upon him. He was angry and it turned into grief. It transformed. It grieved him. He was grieved at the condition of their hearts. Because a heart can be hard, can it? You know that. I know that. Our hearts can be hard. They can be calloused. They can be hard to the things of God and they can be compassionless against people. I grieve Jesus. I want to change these hearts. So he said to the man, stretch out, his hand, stretch out your hand. I love this. It's kind of like, you know, his hand is withered. If he could stretch out his hand, he'd stretch it out up to this point. At the word of Jesus, stretch it out. And he's healed in front of them all. The text tells us that when this happened, the Pharisees went out immediately. Again, the significance of that word to those of us who have been working through Mark together. It's very significant. This is a, a word, if you haven't been here with us in previous weeks, that Mark has been employing to, to show that Jesus was a, a spirit-empowered man driven with authority to do things very powerfully. And Mark says, they immediately went out and they held counsel together with the Herodians against him. Now again, this is, a, this is an unlikely group of bedfellows. The Herodians... And the Pharisees, before we had John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees, now he's got the Herodians and the Pharisees. The Herodians were supporters of King Herod. They used religion. They used Judaism to advance the political purposes of Herod amongst the Roman Empire. Okay, These were men that were loyal to King Herod and they, they gave homage to Rome and they gave homage to Judaism, but you know, this was the mixture of religion and politicism, and they were really working towards political ends. That's what they were about. They were Herodians loyal to Herod. So unlikely bedfellows, but their unity was this with the Pharisees. They had a desire to destroy Jesus. Again, verse 6, the Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. And so in Mark's gospel from chapter two, it begins with just something happening in the hearts of men when Jesus declares his authority to forgive sins. So this is blasphemy. And Jesus addressed it. And now all the way through one, two, three, four, five narratives, Mark's collection tells us about the authority of Jesus and this rising opposition, and it ripens with this plot right here in verse 6 of chapter 3. A united hatred to destroy Jesus. And as I think about this text this morning, there's uh, three things that strike my own heart and mind, and I'll pass them on to you. 
The first one is this. I desire to have a soft heart as I read this, don't you? So Lord, protect me from being a hard-hearted person. Break my heart for the things that break yours. Father, give me compassion for people in need like Christ had compassion for people in need. The second thing is this. The Pharisees didn't know the day in which they lived. Church, we can't be like that. We have to know the time in which we live. These are exciting times to serve Jesus, you know. Watch what's happening in Israel and continue to pray for them and God would give victory there. Watch what's happening with wars and rumors of wars and all the different things that are going on around the world. Let's not be blind to the time in which we live. The day of redemption is drawing nigh. The third thing that strikes me about this text is the garments and the wineskins. We want our lives not to be old and crusty, right, Christians? Religious like Pharisees. We need the Lord to make us vessels appropriate for the presence of the Holy Spirit who wants to function and work and power and authority. And if you get old and crusty in your Christian faith, it's going to blow up. And so may the Lord soften us and make us new wineskins. We're dependent upon him to do that this morning. So would you stand with me? I'm going to invite the worship team to come. Let's pray. And then uh, we'll close with some worship. Lord Jesus, this morning we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for these accounts in Mark's gospel that just show us how opposition rose against you. But Jesus... This morning before you and before heaven, the host of heaven, we just confess that it's not our desire to be in opposition to you, Jesus, but to be in alignment with you. To have you exert your lordship and rule over our hearts and over our lives. So Jesus, we pray this morning that we would be clothed in Christ. We pray this morning that we would be uh, fresh wineskins for the presence of the Holy Spirit. New, Lord. Would you make us new, Lord Jesus? We thank you that you can take that which is old and you can recreate. You can make that which is new. We could be born again of your spirit. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us to understand the day and the time in which we live. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would soften our hearts, Lord. That you would make us men and women of compassion for those around us. Lord, that we'd be loving that when we'd see a need, we would have the awareness and the ability to step in and serve. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Jesus, we worship you. You're Lord of the Sabbath. You're the son of David. You're the bridegroom. And, Lord, we thank you that your church is the bride. And so we look unto you, Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith. Amen.